we've already discussed the, the data. We absolutely uh, believe that the, the database and the tracking for accountability is essential in order to be able to do trend analysis to further address the issue. Uh, without that, uh, we continue to um, just kind of chase tails around the table. Great. Mr. Flake, you have any questions? I'll just yield my time to Mr. Turner. I know he's Mr. Been Turner. On this a lot. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, <coughs> In, in looking to the report, General uh, Dunbar, you and I spoke about the issue that um, there are a number of recommendations in it that are for congressional action. Uh, as you know, the National Defense Authorization Act will be moving here in the next couple of months. Um, Jane Harmon and I last year got a f number of things that were in it. Um, you know, obviously, the report, uh, we can peruse through it and pick out those things that, uh, uh, that are highlighted as congressional action to take action, but I wondered if uh, DOD, in response to the report, had plans on providing us um, the, uh, the legislative direction in some of the areas that, that you're making uh, a, um, a suggestion that Congress take action. Uh, is that on your to-do list, uh, or will you be leaving it to us to go through the report and begin to initiate those items? Congressman Turner, we provided those recommendations to the Department of Defense and the Secretary of Defense, uh, and the military services are looking at that, and uh, they will be providing Secretary Secretary of Defense, I believe on the 1st of March, will be providing uh, the report with his comments. Uh, so we will leave it up to the Department of Defense. The task force, for the most part, has concluded its review uh, in providing the report to the Secretary of Defense. Ms. McGinn, are you aware of, of whether or not, I mean, they had some very specific recommendations when we met in my office. I, I saw the urgency of it and was saying, you know, gosh, we need to, need to get on these. Uh, as you know, the, the bill will be moving in the next couple of months. Are, are you aware of whether or not, um, in, I wouldn't want to miss a whole year. Uh, that DOD has it on its agenda to get those items to us? If I'm not mistaken, I think in the process right now, we have been working with the military departments, looking at all of the recommendations of the task force and sorting out an overall DOD response <coughs> because not everybody agrees with everything. And so our job is to adjudicate that and make it a consolidated position for the secretary. As we do that, if we see things that need legislative action, um, we can certainly formulate them for legislative action. I appreciate your commitment on that because the, the um, I, I would, on the ones that you agree with that are in the report, we should move now. Um, and uh, the uh, rather than our just taking them and, and putting them forward and then waiting for a response, it would be great if we could work together on that. But just to be honest with you, our process might take longer than that. The process, the bureaucratic process in the building. So well, and that's we'll the have information I needed to know because if we need to start the process without a DOD, we certainly have the report and, and I can uh, get with uh, right. members, including Jane, to see what items that, that she sees that are important that we might need to move forward. Thank you, Ms. Hammond. Do you have an additional question or two, Your Honor? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Does well, I assume your committee I'm member? Ms. Uh, Spear, if, if you're done, that, that she's oh. next and final here. Well, if if I would you got to go with it. to you first. If I got to go now. You have it. Go with it. And okay. I'll go to the okay. Two things. First, uh, the comment on leadership. Uh, I surely agree. I have spoken personally to the Secretary of Defense and the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs about speaking out on this issue. Uh, we all know that "Don't Ask, Don't Tell" has gotten a lot of airtime lately. I personally hope we repeal that policy. But they have spoken out on that issue, and I would just use my my time to urge them to speak out on on this very compelling issue. But here's my question. In the, uh, I understand in, in the new GAO report, you have findings, for example, that say victims don't seek uh, prosecutions for fear of a humiliating public trial. And you also say that uh, half the women who do not report rape or sexual assault do so for fear of retaliation. There are remedies for these things. For example, you could recommend uh, um, some, some way to close the trial so it would not be publicly humiliating, or you could recommend um, th that, that uh, people uh, have an easier time to uh, seek a base transfer in the case of those who, uh, who worry that they would be uh, retaliated against. That was one of the issues in the Lauterbach problem. Um, why, don't you make, why didn't you make those recommendations? I think this is the uh, task force report. I see. Not okay. To be Excuse me. The, I uh, did confuse GAO it with yours. Report. Defense task force. You folks in the middle. Why didn't you make those recommendations? I, I think, uh, Congresswoman, all the, the 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 many areas that we looked at, uh, we uh, we understood the role 
of leadership we understood the when we went around and we interviewed all the all the commanders and especially the courts martial convening authorities in every place and you saw the extensive list of visitations that we did we looked at whether or not they aggressively addressed the issue of sexual assault and how aggressively they prosecuted any sort of concerns with that arose within their commands and this this the feeling that we got as a as a task force was that the majority the major majority of commanders and courts martial convening authorities not only take this seriously but they're out aggressively prosecuting where they can with the advice of counsel as far as the safety issues we have specific recommendations for the safety the safety of victims and we we were very very concerned about the way victims were treated once they reported to their command and even those that in a restricted way reported to the chaplain or someone else we as the general mentioned we were very concerned about the safety and security issues we even went to the into the into the the barracks and in the dormitories of the Air Force we went to see about the the security issues that were there and how were people handled how were they processed how were they tended to when whenever they reported an incident of sexual assault so that was our part of our focus a very important part of our focus and our recommendations I think did address some of those issues well let me just conclude mr. chairman that I I think the rate of prosecutions lags way behind civil society and I think there's much more to do and part of it is a training issue for prosecutors and again I think the army offers the best example for what needs to be done there and on the safety issue there are some specific recommendations that I I think could have been in your report and weren't for example facilitating base transfer which would encourage a lot of women to come forward who would otherwise be afraid to do so and and if they did so in the case of Lauterbach would would have a horrible outcome so I just I think there's more to do and I think it needs to focus around prevention much more than just response and we would get a lot farther a lot faster with this epidemic among those who step forward to protect our country and who in fact we don't protect well enough thank you mr. chairman I appreciate the opportunity to be here appreciate your interest and concern the gentleman from California was spear we thank you for your interest and for your leadership on this issue we're happy you could join us here today you're recognized for five minutes thank you mr. chairman a question to the task force my understanding is that in 2008 there were 2265 unrestricted reports that were filed of those reports how many of them then were pursued as full criminal investigations and court-martialed Congresswoman, I believe that actually the SAPRO office is better suited because they have the data for that to answer the question. Right. I think we have the report for this. I just want to make sure, as the State of Representative from San Diego, where the tragedy finally opened up this book, caused not only by our black and American people. There were 2,389 investigations on reports made in this and prior years. And you know, we collect data by fiscal year, but certainly if a, an assault occurs in September, for example, that case is not, it could be, um, would be, may not be completed by then. But there were 2,763 subjects. 592 were pending deposition, disposition. 136 subjects were civilians or foreign nationals not subject to the UCMJ, so the commander couldn't take action. There were 129 subjects that were unidentified. Uh, there were 1,074 subjects that had cases that were unsubstantiated, unfounded, lacked sufficient evidence, or involved a victim that recanted or a subject that died. There were 1,339 subjects that were referred by commanders for the following actions. There were 317 referred for courts martial, 247 for non-judicial punishment, and 268 administrative actions or discharges. All right. If, if I understand this correctly, over half of the cases, or just about half of the cases, were not dealt with. You said 1,074 
because of lack of evidence or recanting or the like. So half of those, half of those people who had the guts to come forward were dismissed for whatever reasons, correct? And then of the remaining, you have 317 that were court martials of that original 2300 figure and 247 that had some kind of um, administrative action taken. So I'm in the service. I know those figures. What's the likelihood of me reporting a second time when of those who had the guts to report end up seeing that half of them are thrown out? Now, I don't know the, the, the circumstances under what, when they were or how they were thrown out, but those numbers are chilling. And if, in fact, there are so many more that go unreported for the very reason that they're concerned about ostracism or uh, retaliation, we've got a bigger problem than one might suspect. Um, well, there's another point that we have six different categories of sexual assault in the UCMJ, from the least egregious, which would be indecent touching, to uh, aggravated assault or rape. So there's a wide variety of sexual assaults. It's not just rape. But what you were well, talking wait a few, about. With all due respect, uh -huh. um, unwelcome touching to me is an assault. Mm -hmm. And I think for most women, it would be an assault. So to somehow diminish them because there are, th there are levels of gravity is not really comforting. Uh, and well, the commander does have the discretion to award a punishment that he feels, um, that feels fits the crime, if you will. And we do provide synopses in our annual report, which describes each of these cases. And I don't think you will get any of us disagreeing with you. And we know we can do better. And just as Ms. Harmon said, part of her interest um, and her relationship with the former Secretary of the Army, uh, we are looking closer at how to train trial counsel. And we actually just got the funding to train prosecutors and investigators uh, so that we can improve the process. But I, I wanted to comment on something. You used the word chilling, and there is something in the literature called the chilling effect. And if you do send a case to courts martial, and that person gets off. By the time it gets back to the people in the unit or the people in the academy, they think so usually the perception is the victim lied. Or, um, but, and it, it, does, it has a tremendous effect when that happens. So I, I would suggest a couple things. One is there's got to be a way to you know, videotape a victim and change their voice so that they aren't necessarily specifically identifiable. Um, two, um, I think that there should be a zero tolerance policy that is communicated everywhere um, that, and then is reflected in, in what actually takes place. And third, I think there should be some kind of a review of those women who come forward and who make a complaint. There is a court martial. The individual uh, perpetrator is court martialed. What then happens to the victim in their professional career? I'd like to tra see us track them to see what is their life like afterwards. Because if their life is, for all intents and purposes, professionally destroyed, that sends us yet another message of why we're not getting people coming forward. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you very much. Uh, that concludes our questioning of this panel. I, I just want to take one moment to thank our friends from the General Accountability Office. You've been steadfast and incredibly helpful on this, and I suspect your work isn't done. At some point, we may want you to sort of look at this again for us or whatever, but I, w I just want to thank you for, for the great work that you've done. Uh, Dr. Iacello and uh, General Dunbar, thank you for your service generally to the country or whatever, but for specifically on this task force. Uh, from I understand from your testimony that you think you're done now, and, and you're, is that complete? You complete your responsibilities on this? So I'm sure uh, that you're on to other things or whatever, but we appreciate a great deal of the work that you did. We understand the magnitude of it, the time and effort that went into it, and the specificity in your report is incredibly helpful. And I, I really believe that it's going to be looked at and used as a guide uh, to folks going forward. So thank both of you as well. And Dr. Whitley and Ms. McGinn, uh, when this whole series of hearings started, uh, we weren't too favorably disposed towards the department's attitude toward this, and that's nothing personal against Dr. Whitley because I think she had her work impeded. Uh, Mr. Rodriguez and others, I think, were horrible, uh, and I think they did things that they shouldn't have done. I think their attitude wasn't where it should be on this issue. I am impressed uh, with both of you uh, with a sense of responsibility and desire to deal with this. I think we have ways to go, and I think your acknowledgement of that is comforting to us, 
uh, that you understand exactly what's going on here and that there's work to do and you seem quite willing to do it and to use the good resources that you've had at your disposal to get it done. I think I can speak for the rest of the committee on this. We appreciate that. It has not always been the case. It gives us a feeling that as we go forward, we don't have to have hearing after hearing after hearing to see whether or not the Department of Defense takes us seriously uh, on that. So good luck going forward on that. Thank you, everybody, for your work on that. I, I hope that the men and women in the service are somewhat comforted by the fact that you're on it, you're on the case, and you're working on it, and as a group, uh, we'll all take this as a, a joint challenge and move forward. Uh, thank you very much. At this point in time, I want to thank the witnesses on this panel, and we'll now receive testimony from our second panel before us, Mr. Merle Wilberding. Thank you, folks, for allowing Mr. Wilberding to take his seat. General. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Wilberding. Thank you very much for being here. Mr. Merle Wilberding is an attorney with the law firm of Coolidge Wall in Dayton, Ohio. He represented Mary Lauterbach after the death of her daughter, Lance Corporal Maria Lauterbach. He has previously worked with a number of additional families of victims of military sexual assault. He is also a retired captain in the United States Army, where he served in the Judge Advocate General Corps. Mr. Wilberding brings a uh, JD, holds a JD from the University of Notre Dame. So I want to thank you, Mr. Wilberding, for coming here, making your time uh, to be, make yourself available for us and help us. I ask that you please stand. Just raise your right hand. And do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you very much. And with that, Mr. Wilberding, you have a statement. I understand your full statement will be put on the record, of course. But if you could tell us in five minutes generally uh, your points, your high points on that, we'd appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Tierney, Congressman Blake, and members of the panel. I appreciate the opportunity to appear before you today. I have submitted my written statement, and I'll keep a, give you a short summary right now. I'm Merle Wilberding. I'm an attorney from Dayton, Ohio. During the Vietnam War, I served as a captain in the Army Judge Advocate General's Corps. Since early January of 2008, I have represented Mary Lauterbach, the mother of Marine Lance Corporal Maria Lauterbach, who had filed a claim of sexual assault against fellow Marine Corporal Cesar Lorian, only to be murdered six months later and buried in a shallow fire pit in Cesar Lorian's backyard. At a hearing before this subcommittee on July 31, 2008, Mary Lauterbach became the voice of her daughter as she shared the fears and harassment that Maria had endured after she had filed the sexual assault complaint. This afternoon I want to talk about the continuing stream of other victims and their families who have reached out to Mary and me. For me it started in the cemetery after Maria's funeral. I was approached by three or four women, all of whom told me that they had been victims of sexual assault in the military, and all of whom told me that their lives had never recovered. As time continued, the stories from other victims continued. In February, we had a call from a mother whose daughter had filed a sexual assault claim against a fellow soldier. My heart went out to her as she said, Maria's story could have been my daughter's story. 
The only difference between my daughter and Maria Lauterbach is that Maria is dead. In March, we had another call from a mother whose 19-year-old daughter had filed a sexual assault claim against a fellow soldier. Instead of receiving protection and programs to help her recover, she was haunted by the ostracism and disbelief of the fellow members of the unit. Meanwhile, the accused was treated with sympathy and deference as the case moved forward. In June, after the NBC Dateline aired a program on Mar Maria Lauterbach's case, we received a telephone call from a mother who had watched the program. Her 20-year-old daughter was a Marine who had just made a sexual assault claim. Now she feared for her life. She had a military victim advocate assigned to her, but the victim advocate told her that there wasn't really anything she could do for her. All of these stories were virtually identical. The complaining victim became isolated and harassed. Their lives were disoriented. The victim became the accused. The accused became the victim. Significantly, all of these victims were no longer effectively contributing to the mission of the military. I want to focus on victim advocates, or as I often call them, victim listeners. In every discussion I have had with victims and victims' families, the victim advocate was described as a very nice person who expressed her concern and understanding, but was not proactive and was not independent and either could not or was not able to do anything. In Maria Lauterbach's case, her victim advocate was her direct report within the chain of command. Consequently, her victim advocate had to think about her own efficiency reports, her own performance reviews, and her own obligations to the command. I have read the report of the Defense Task Force on Sexual Assault in the Military Services. There are recommendations to improve the Victim Advocate Program, but I do not believe they go far enough. Victim advocates need, to, need the ability and the training to be more proactive. It is at these most critical times that the victim advocate must act. It is important to remember that these victims are often 18 to 21 years old and at this point very vulnerable, very much alone, and very much incapable of making good decisions. Victim advocates need clear authority to act independent of the command. Congress could, should consider establishing a line of authority for victim advocates that is outside the base chain of command. Are we making progress? I'm at the, the boots of the ground level. What I see is not progress. I've heard the testimony of the panel before and, and the difficulties of making progress and of measuring progress, and I accept their testimony for what it was. But I do not think we've done enough. We need to do more. Victims need a better protection system to survive sexual assaults in the military and the military needs a better victim protection system to protect their own interest in continuing to have a, a supportive and uh, healthy and active uh, military force. And thank you, and I'm open for any questions you have. Thank you, sir. We appreciate that. Uh, why don't we start the question with Mr. Turner, who uh, was kind enough to make sure that your testimony was procured for us here today. Mr. Turner? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you again and also the Ranking Member Flank uh, for uh, allowing Mr. Wilberding to testify um, in, uh, in addition to uh, his work. Obviously, his perspective is, with the Lauterbach family, his perspective is very helpful to us as he has reviewed the report uh, that uh, we had just received. Uh, I'd like to ask you, if I could, to enter into the record a, um, um, an op-ed piece that Mr. Wilberding has uh, written sexual assault in the military looking for a few good changes that has some of the recommendations that he had just without objection so ordered and um, <coughs> I uh, wanted to ask Mr. Wilberding in, in your did, when you, um, you began to represent the Lauterbach family and the facts began to unfold um, <coughs> you had a critical eye and ability to look at um, where where things went wrong where the military and DOD did things wrong um, and uh, and I've greatly appreciated that because it's been a, an a great assistance to me as we've looked to legislation that might be able to address some of the issues. But one thing I find really compelling about the story of your experience since uh, you began working with the Lauterbach family is that others have come to you. And they've come to you with their stories of their experience. Um, why do you think people are, have, are reaching out so and have been contacting you to tell you their stories also? Well, it's been an interesting process in, in the time period now, really 
two years from that. And people have called from all over the country. Uh, the cases I cited here, uh, they were in military bases throughout the country. And each time what was consistent to me was that they had nowhere to turn to. They had no, their daughters in every case uh, uh, could not, did not have any uh, faith and trust in the victim advocate that they were dealing with. They didn't have any faith in the superiors dealing with. They were really struggling. And these are, for the most part, um, hardworking people who didn't have the money to go to the faraway places. In every instance, as their daughter was a very long distance from home. So there wasn't the support system for the daughter uh, from the home that you could have, for example, if a rape occurred in a college atmosphere, there are a lot of other ones. But in the military, it's different. And I think they were reaching out to us primarily because, one, they wanted to tell their story. I thought they, they really wanted to get the story out of the struggles and frustrations they were had. And two, I think they were looking for a support group to have them uh, reassure that, uh, uh, that thing people cared about. I thought that was what I really felt is that they were so alone, their daughters were so alone, and they were getting no support from anyone in the military, and that's what they were reaching out for. Well, your recommendation on the victim advocates and uh, taking them from the chain of command, how will that allow them to be more proactive, and, and what, would that, well, what would that do to help us in, in the system? Well, I it's an interesting concept, and, and especially in the light of the conversation uh, from the panel, uh, earlier today, I, my initial thought had always been that when the Marines issued their statement on January 15th of 2008, remember that her body was found on Friday, January 11th, and at 3 o'clock the Marines issued a nine-page opening statement, they called it, that listed everything they had done and what struck me about it, and by the way, they read it to us, uh, I was in a conference room with Mary Lauterbach, they read it to us. Uh, um, literally minutes before they walked in front and read it. So we had no opportunity to see it in advance and we're trying to take notes on it. But what struck me about that nine page opening statement was, it was a series of statements as to providing some basis for why they didn't do what they had, uh, didn't uh, take things seriously, didn't take certain actions, didn't pursue her. Everything seemed to us that it looked like they were given reasons why they didn't do anything and why their guesses at that were, were reasonable guesses. And what struck me is there wasn't anything in there, gee whiz, we could have done more, we should have done more. Uh, it came across with not a mea culpa, but a Maria culpa. It really struck me as they were saying, well, nobody gave us all the hard evidence if you had just told me all that. And they're putting the burden on the on the accused to connect the dots, and there were a lot of red alerts in that. And what struck me about the conference and the panel earlier was that I, when the question was same asked, why wasn't it in the report? And the response was they talked to the commanders, uh, and I have a good appreciation for that uh, uh, and a good amount of respect for them, great respect for them. When you talk to the commanders, it's like uh, the same situation, my reaction is the same as what I saw here. And it's the same as people in general. When people look at facts, they tend to look at it as reinforcing their own position. When institutions look at facts, they tend to look at the facts reinforcing their own position. So when the Marines looked at the Lauterbach facts, they looked at it in the sense of, well, we did this, we did that, nobody told us about this, nobody told us about that. And that's what I heard, frankly, in my view of the commanding generals. Do we need an independent one? No, we, we're, we're doing a good job ourselves. And I, and I sort of sense that that's, that's how the, that's in part human nature and part institutional nature, but I think it's something to keep in mind as you evaluate those positions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Wolverine. Thank you. Well, where would the uh, line of authority lie to best ensure that independence? Well, that's a fair question. And, and a, and a reasonable opportunity as to whether or not there's, uh, I recognize the suggestion that it should be a DOD employee of a civilian or a member of the military if it's a military victim advocate. Um, but I think if they talk about it, and I've been out of the Army for a number of years, but the Defense uh, Council and the military have a, have, a, uh, have a separate chain of command that the prosecutors don't have, and they did that to create some independence in that. And in 
terms of that, why I think it's important, and, and Mil Maria's case is a good illustration, is the Marines gave their statement on January 15th, said this is what happened, every fact is true, and nobody told us differently, and we obviously don't have any obligation to pursue it. But in doing that, they uh, didn't really look at what had happened beforehand, and like consequently things just fell by the wayside, and they didn't the have a the independent victim advocate saying, uh, uh, particularly in that period, which, which should have been all the time, from May until right December, she went missing on December 14th, the victim advocate could have been and should have been doing more things. But from December 14th to January 11th, to me, that's where an independent advocate could have been most helpful. You know, what about this evidence? So Mary Lauterbach and some other could have been in contact with her. Found this, found that. Why don't you do more? Yeah, I, I guess I get that aspect of it. I think it's a point well made. But but who to whom would that victim advocate report? I think they would have to create that system within the within the military. And what about the task force recommendation that there would be privileged communications between the advocate and the and the victim? Is that a good idea? I think that's a very good recommendation. I read the victim stories in Appendix, in Appendix F and uh, detailed the stories where uh, defense counsel for the accused had uh, essentially taken the depositions, called them as trial. I think that's a very good suggestion. Mr. Flake? Mr. Turner? Sir, I want to thank you for coming all the way to make your suggestions. I appreciate you letting us put your article on the record. I think these are things that will help inform our decisions as we go forward, and particularly with uh, that one idea that certainly needs and warrants to be explored. So uh, our appreciation. Thank you. Uh, with that, the, me the meeting is adjourned. Thank you.